We'll be getting started in just another moment or two. Okay. Welcome to the third Lunch and Learn workshop of the week. Um, we are so excited for you all to be joining us live from um, either your workplace or your home, um, but we're excited for our Lunch and Learn workshops this year. We've had some amazing presentations so far and our amazing panels um, in the evenings. Today, we are super excited to be welcoming Stuart Hines from the Gay and Lesbian Archives of Mid-America. Um, before I introduce Stuart though, I would like to um, just remind you of a few things. Um, our in-person events have been rescheduled and you can see a revised or schedule on our website and as on the Facebook event. Um, tonight's social that was scheduled for Stony Bees has been canceled due to the rise of COVID-19 cases here in Montgomery County. We wanna keep our community safe as well as all of the participants safe. Tomorrow night's drag show has also been rescheduled to, uh, or been moved to the 4-H building at the park and that starts at 7 p.m or the doors open at seven and the show starts at 7 p.m. And then our Saturday event has been condensed and moved to the band shell at the park. And that will be from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. We still have Stephanie, Representative Stephanie Byers coming as our keynote speaker. We have some wonderful performers and some an award ceremony and we'll be handing out uh, picnic lunches to the first uh, 100 people that come to the event. So you won't want to miss that. Yes, there was some changes and we apologize, but our main goal is to keep everyone safe and celebrate pride. Um, but today you all tuned in for our Lunch and Learn workshop. And we are bringing back Stuart Hines this year to talk about the LGBTQ community in the 1960s. Stuart Hines is the curator of special collections and archives at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He is the co-founder or a co-founder of the Gay and Lesbian Archives of Mid-America, the home of Kansas City's LGBT heritage since 2009. He has strong family roots in Southeast Kansas and is extremely excited to, and proud to be speaking again at this year's Southeast Kansas Pride Festival. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to welcome Stuart and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. And then I'll start sharing mine. You need to give me permission. There we go. Sorry, everyone. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. I, as as um, Brendan said, I'm really, really excited to, to be presenting to you again. Um, and today I wanna talk about uh, uh, queer activism in the 1960s. Uh, both nationally and uh, looking a little bit at some of the activity that went on here in Kansas City, because some of the work that happened here in Kansas City actually affected the national movement as well. So it has never been easy to be a gay person, an LGBT person in, in this country. And it was particularly challenging after the Second World War. Um, in large part because of uh, uh, oppression that was brought on for a variety of reasons, um, both by the military and by um, the federal government. And so uh, the late 40s and throughout the 1950s becomes a period of really, really strong oppression and repression of queer communities um, all across the United States. Um, but World War II itself was a, a real turning point for, uh, in particular, gays and lesbians, because what it did was allow people from places like Chautauqua or Caney or uh, Purdy, Missouri, to discover, number one, the fact that there were other gay people in the world, and therefore they didn't 
feel so isolated and alone. And so what happens when the war ends is that instead of going back to the small towns that many folks came from, they end up congregating in coastal cities like San Francisco and New York, Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. Um, so you start to see a, a, a growing visible population in these cities. And because of that visibility, that oppression really becomes more, um, more brutal. And you see people, you see um, bars uh, being raided all the time. Uh, people being arrested, uh, people being entrapped uh, by undercover police officers in known cruising areas. Um, there's a, a coordinated and official push by the federal government to weed out gays and lesbians from federal, federal employment, in particular uh, in the State Department. Uh, but all across the uh, different units of the federal of the federal government and when eisenhower comes into office he one of his first actions is to sign an executive order that uh that uh, officially um can uh, officially supports and and requires uh not only the not hiring of uh, queer people, but also the elimination of people who already work for the federal government, queer people who already work for the federal government. So it, it just it's just a really, really challenging time on many different levels. And so to address some of those challenges, what happens in the early 1950s, as early as 1950, uh, are the establishment of advocacy groups um, primarily on the West Coast. And these are the three primary ones. The Mattachine Society is formed in Los Angeles in 1950. One incorporated is formed also in Los Angeles in 1953. And the Daughters of Belitis is the first lesbian advocacy group. And it starts in San Francisco in 1955. Now the names are intentionally uh, vague. Uh, again, this being a period of really stringent oppression, they couldn't call themselves the Homosexual Advocacy Group of Los Angeles, right? So they came up with these obscure kinds of um, labels for their organizations, in part as a security measure. Um, Mattachines were uh, court figures that hid behind masks and spoke truth to power. They would they would uh, uh, sp speak truth to um, to royalty. Um, one comes from a, a quote about all men being um, part of one. I can't remember it right now. And then the daughters of Belitis. Belitis is a minor figure in the poetry of uh, Sappho, uh, ancient Greek lesbian poet. She lived on the island of Lesbos, and that's where we get the name lesbian. So, so these groups form and they start to look at the issues that uh, are prominent in the community and particularly with regard to oppression and trying to figure out ways to strategize to address some of these concerns. Uh, oppression um, socially, uh, in, in employment, in military service, um, in the field of psychiatry, all sorts of different things that they're looking at. And the way that they examine these issues and stimulate discussion about them is through their publications. And these are the publications of each organization, the Mattachian Review, obviously from the Mattachian Society, one from one incorporated and the latter was from the Daughters of Belitis. So these uh, start a little bit after each organization starts and they are distributed to memberships uh, across the country, because what happens is chapters of each of these organizations get established in cities throughout the United States. And so these are mailed to members across the country, and it's in the pages of these magazines that the debates around these issues happen, keeping in mind, of course, that this is all pre-internet, and it's a much slower way to have a conversation, but nonetheless, the conversation happens. 
And fortunately it happened on paper. And so we have a record of, of what people thought about and what people were thinking about during this time. And the other thing that happens as part of this is that this really triggers the formation of a national community because you've got people again scattered across the country who are talking about the same issues and again recognizing that there are others like them who have thoughts similar to them or that may differ from them but at least they can talk about them again in these magazines and so by the early 1960s sort of 10 years 10 five to 10 years into the growth of these organizations they aren't really making much progress and what you start to see in in the early 60s 63 4 5 is the emergence of some activists who want to take a little bit more um confrontational approach and this guy is one of them this was a man who was out of washington dc and he organized some of the first uh public protests uh, for gay rights uh, in that city. His name was Frank Kameny. Um, he was uh, joined by this young woman, Barbara Giddings. She was out of Philadelphia. She uh, worked with Kameny on some of the activities that they were doing in Washington, but she also became editor of the latter in the mid 1960s. And during her time as editor, she sort of um, pushed it a little bit to be a little more overt like putting the word lesbian on the cover of your lesbian oriented magazine, um, which the leadership of the Daughters of Belitis did not care for. They were, they were based in San Francisco. And she, like I said, she was in Philadelphia doing all this editing work. And so she uh, didn't last very long as an editor because she was pissing people off. And then this guy also in Philadelphia, Clark Pollock, um, he merges the notion of, um, erotic identity with advocacy. And his magazine was called Drum. And it starts um, in, I believe, 65. The particular issue is from 66. So these competing ideas about how to achieve civil rights, uh, again, are being debated in these magazines and um, lead these three individuals to join about 25 others to come to Kansas City in 1966 for the first ever gathering of gay and lesbian civil rights leaders in the United States. They met in Kansas City in a hotel downtown, the Hotel State, and uh, over the course of a weekend in February, and re really it was uh, uh, a way to sort of get to know each other and to think about ways to strategize um, approaches and eliminate duplication of effort. And one of the reasons they came to Kansas City, well, there were a few reasons. Um, one, because it was centrally located. By this time, by 66, there are groups on both coasts. Like I mentioned, Philadelphia, Washington, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco. And so they were having trouble trying to figure out which coast to go to. And so they decided to meet in the middle. One man who was involved very heavily in the Mattachian Society had worked in Kansas City. He'd worked for the newspaper. So he knew people here and recommended that uh, he and others recommended that they meet in Kansas City. And that's exactly what happened. Another reason that they met in Kansas City is because Kansas City had an al already had a vibrant uh, gay scene going on at this time. There were a number of different bars in town. Um, the Gaslight was um, sort of in the West Fort neighborhood, if you know Kansas City. The Rail Room was a lesbian bar down by uh, Union Station, the train station here in town. And it's an interesting bar in that during the day, it was um, frequented by uh, railroad workers. And then after about five o'clock, it magically transforms into a lesbian bar with the approval of the ownership. So um, just an interesting, interesting little bar. They had their own house band, the rail, rail runners. Um, but it was in existence for most of the 1960s. The Arabian Nights was also a sort of neighborhood bar, um, uh, featured uh, um, some drag performances, but really it was it was piano bar in many it, it, during this during this decade. The Redhead was also in existence in in the heart of the Westport neighborhood, and it was also a piano bar. Um, 
not much uh, other live entertainment, um, but they did feature piano and singing and it was extremely popular with, with the community here. But um, the probably the best known uh, bar during this period was the Jewel Box Lounge, which was located at 3223 Troost. Um, and it, was known as a center for female impersonation. If uh, you remember my talk last year, if you happened to attend, I talked a lot about female impersonation during the 1930s. And this bar sort of continues that tradition. And it became known nationally on the circuit for uh, being the home of impersonation and a very successful home. It was a really, really popular bar initially started out um, uh, showing drag in, in about 1959. And early on it was, it drew a big gay crowd and then um, more and more straight people started to come. And so uh, it really does become more of a straight club that features female impersonators. Like uh, this impersonator, this is from 1959. And this is the same year, excuse me, a different impersonator, uh, Skip Arnold. This, this, um, this queen was uh, beloved in the community, um, very well known. Uh, people adored Skip. Uh, most of these performers sang their own songs. Uh, well, all of them did initially. And Skip uh, also did a comedy routine and um, did a lot of charitable work. And so just was very... Uh, uh, a very uh, prominent figure locally. Um, the club, owing to its success, uh, generates a lot of memorabilia because uh, they're raking in money hand over fist. There were um, generally two shows a night and uh, four on the weekends. And so there was lots of revenue coming in. And so they were able to spend some of that money on memorabilia around um, uh, the club and its performers. This was a little flyer, and you'll note that the Impressionists are listed uh, as Mr. Don or Mr. Nikki St. Cyr, and that was uh, at the insistence of the management because they wanted to continue to impress upon people that these were men who were performing as women. Um, it, was, it was part of the, of the shtick, and it was part of the, uh, uh, the illusion. And this is a this is a postcard from oh probably sixty five, um, featuring some of the performers and the the character in the middle, um, was uh, was uh, performed by Ray Bourbon and uh, it's an example of the way that the show would go. They do their numbers in their in their glamorous gowns and Bourbon included. And then at the end of the show, he would come out on stage and mop the stage and make a commentary, comedic commentary on the evening's uh, performances. And then at the end, reveal himself to be who he was. And everyone would walk away shocked and, and surprised that this um, washer lady was, was actually the glamorous Ray Bourbon. And Bourbon is a very interesting figure. Uh, uh, again, in my talk last year, we ended talking about Ray Bourbon. He had performed in Kansas City as early as 1934. He performed as a female impersonator throughout most of the mid 20th century, from the 30s to the 60s. And he released uh, recordings, sang his own songs, and, and released recordings uh, on 78, on 78 RPM records. And then um, when they came into fashion, he released a number of LPs. Um, these are uh, samples of some of those LPs. I wanna say about a dozen all told. And um, he's a character, man. He, Bourbon was a really, really interesting guy. Um, like I said, he performed uh, from the, uh, at least the thirties, maybe as early as the twenties into the 1960s. And after World War II, when that era of oppression kicks in, it also affects um, female impersonators and they have challenges uh, doing, doing work. And 
bourbon included. He had really hard time in the 50s finding jobs um, because in many instances, the show would be shut down or he would be arrested for violating uh, a local ordinance that um, prohibited female impersonation. So around the time of um, the Christine Jorgensen story, Christine Jorgensen was uh, the first person to receive what we would now call uh, gender confirmation surgery in the mid 1950s. She went to Denmark and, and, and got surgery. And so Bourbon sees this as an opportunity to sort of sidestep the challenges that he is having as an impersonator. And he insists that he went to Mexico and uh, had the same surgery that Christine Jorgensen did. And uh, so that now he can come back as a complete female and perform with no fear of harassment from law enforcement. Of course, he didn't have surgery, but uh, it got the law off his back. Um, he even made some, uh, he made an LP um, about his experiences and used it as part of the advertising for some of his shows. Um, really kind of astounding. But he ends his career, he comes to Kansas City at, towards the end of his career and ends his, his, his female impersonating career here in Kansas City. He made an album, a live album of a show that he did at the Jewel Box. Um, and this is the cover of the album and an advertising flyer. And I'm gonna try and play a little snippet of the recording for you. Just as, a, as an aside, all of Ray Bourbon's uh, recordings are available on the Internet Archive, which is a, which is as the name indicates, is a big archive of Internet stuff that people can contribute to and they collect stuff. So if you're interested, you can pursue more Bourbon there. I will give you a heads up. It is a little crude. So um, let's try and see. Oh, God damn, I'm tired tonight. Had a bitch of a day to start with. I got up. <laughs> I started the whole mess. I was so drunk and I got out of bed, I decided to do the wash. You never live when you see a drunken bitch trying to get a mattress into a Bendix. <laughs> I couldn't get the door shut, so I crawled in to hold it. <laughs> Came out clean, but little giddy. <laughs> I needed some change for the half a buck and change team. You got seventy-four dollars back. Then I got arrested for playing a slot machine. <laughs> then the boil in the basement blew up, and I rode the crapper all the way to the bus depot. I'm at the bus depot. I'm fixing to get on the bus to go home. I bend over to pick up the lunch. The porter pulls loose, shoots me, and a tit flies out. <laughs> A dog grabbed it. I chased the dog for two blocks trying to get the knocker back. <laughs> I think I'm the only woman in America who's ever done a two-minute mile with her tit up. So you get a sense of, <laughs> of what that is like. Um, and they're all like that. So early, much earlier on, um, it's very similar, but it's a lot of wordplay in song. Uh, so if, again, if you're interested, all the recordings are accessible to you. So in 1968, uh, Bourbon uh, decides to uh, retire and move to Mexico. And on his way to Mexico, he was a huge animal lover. And so as he's, as he's on his way to relocate, he has um, probably a trailer, but a caravan, we'll say, of... Um, of about 70 dogs, five cats, and two skunks. And so on the way, he boards these with, um, with a kennel in Big Spring, Texas. And there's some confusion about, um, about the boarding and he gets into a dispute with the owner of the kennel. And it's a, it's a bad enough dispute that Bourbon 
hires a couple of, of, of young men that he knows from Kansas City to kill the kennel owner. And they do. They shoot the man dead with a 45, Bourbon's 45. And so uh, he's arrested and they're all three arrested and all three found guilty. And Bourbon is guilty of being an accomplice. And he is given a life sentence in 1970 and serves his time at a prison in Texas. Um, about fe February of 70 is when he's uh, uh, jailed. And then uh, by July of 71, um, he, he dies of a heart condition. And so uh, not a very glamorous end to uh, a somewhat glamorous um, pro a professional life. So a really, really interesting story. So uh, the other major bar um, for the community um, at the same time is the colony. And the colony was in, the, was in uh, a block, was a block south of the jewel box. And it really was a gay bar. And you can see from the matchbook there, that's how they build themselves. Casey's gay spot uh, with an emphasis on gay. And they, they would do that in the phone book too, which is really kind of amazing for this period in the 1960s <laughs> that they would list themselves as that in the phone book. Um, it was a neighborhood bar and extremely popular. It had drag shows, but it was really more, more piano and, and other kinds of music. And uh, we have a collection that features a number of pictures of folks, um, party pics essentially that you, now you would find on Facebook or wherever. Uh, but these are photographs of club goers outside of the club um, during the 1960s from 59 to 68. And um, just gives you a sense of the variety of people who would, um, would have a good time at the colony. Also uh, simultaneous to all of that, Kansas City had uh, a very active uh, ball, drag ball scene. And these are advertisements, and I was shocked to find them when I did. These are advertisements for drag balls in the local newspaper, the very conservative local newspaper, the Kansas City Star. Um, and they're from uh, some parties that went on in 1965. And again, that same collection has images, uh, uh, more party pics from some of these drag balls. Um, again, the same time period throughout the 1960s. And so it's so obviously um, there's all sorts of evidence to indicate that Kansas City had a very active uh, uh, LGBT scene going on um, at the same time that these activists come to the city. And so when they do come, they stay at the State Hotel in downtown Kansas City at 12th and Wyandotte. And these are a couple of postcards, uh, uh, advertising postcards of the hotel. And, one, of, as you can see, featuring their very groovy jet lounge bar. Um, and again, February of 1966, um, around 30 activists uh, from about 14 different national groups come to Kansas City and really sort of um, introduce themselves to each other and try to figure out ways to, to address these common concerns in a, in, a, in a more tangible way than they've been able to achieve up to this point. And this is a this is an article from the from the star from the local newspaper about that meeting and just some of the things that were discussed and what came out of the meeting uh, were uh, some concrete um, some concrete things um, first and foremost that they were going to meet again in August in San Francisco secondly um, the establishment of uh, a legal fund for people to apply to. Uh, in case they, they get arrested and need help. And most uh, tangibly, um, a coordinated protest uh, against the US military and its treatment of gay and lesbian soldiers um, that was scheduled for Armed Forces Day in May of 66. And this is the first nationally coordinated protest in the United States for LGBT issues. And um, it took place in a number of different cities uh, in the U.S., um, this is this is images from uh, these are images from the protests that took place in San Francisco. The woman there in the jacket is one of the founders of the Daughters of Belitis, and um, they gave speeches to an audience outside of a federal building. 
in Los Angeles. Uh, of course, they drove uh, through the city because that's what Los Angeles is known for. But it, about 14 cars carrying these box signs uh, advocating for uh, gay and lesbian issues drove about 20 miles throughout the city in Los Angeles. In Philadelphia, there was a protest at which they gave out 50,000 flyers to passersby um, stating some of the issues that they wanted addressed by the by the military. And so it was it was a successful uh, event that that garnered some national press. Um, and again, the first nationally coordinated uh, protest that was planned in Kansas City. And at that planning meeting was this guy, Drew Schaefer. And Drew was a Kansas Cityan um, who knew a lot of people on, on the scene. And he was very interested in starting an advocacy group. And um, as, as typically happens in these kinds of meetings, people leave feeling pretty charged up. And so he forms immediately after that, that planning meeting in February of 66, he forms the Phoenix Society for Individual Freedom, Kansas City's first gay advocacy group. And he wastes no time getting it started. This is about a month after that meeting. This is another classified ad in the paper. Um, uh, doesn't say much, but um, it, it's starting to get the word out. And what's interesting about the Phoenix is that uh, gay's parent, or Drew's parents were really, really supportive of him. And he, um, uh, he was influenced by them and was able to take advantage of his father's generosity. His father uh, was a printer and knew how to run a printing press. And so uh, his father helped him produce Kansas, the Phoenix's um, newsletter, much like those other groups in the starting in the 50s had their own newsletters. The Phoenix, of course, had its newsletter. And this is the cover of the one of an issue from 1966 and that first year. And you can see already some of the committees that were part of the society that had been set up uh, as part of the framework and the infrastructure of Phoenix um, right off the bat. Um, and it's in the pages of this monthly newsletter that they, they put together, uh, they compiled and designed and printed and distributed each month. In the pages of these newsletters, we can really get a sense of just how active members of the Phoenix Society were. Um, in, in every issue, there is uh, coverage of religious issues. It's very interesting to me that from the get-go, uh, Phoenix and other um, what they call homophile groups, these groups, um, this movement uh, um, labeled itself a homophile movement um, in an effort to distract, or not distract, but deflect from the sexual nature of the term homosexual and more the affinity nature of a file, like a bibliophile, someone who loves books, or a francophile, someone who loves all things French. Um, a homophile is a lover of the same, uh, a, a queer person, essentially, essentially now we would call them. Um, but uh, it's, it's just really fascinating to me that they, that they connect with the religious community right out of the gate. And uh, there's all sorts of coverage of, of those efforts in the pages of the Phoenix Newsletter. Um, using the pseudonym Estelle Graham, Drew's mother, Phyllis Schaefer, uh, publish it or compiles national and international news um, of interest to this community in each issue every month. And there's um, uh, social news, both locally and as Phoenix members travel across the country and internationally, they report back on the gay scene wherever they were, um, whether it was Texas or Canada or wherever, my, wherever they were traveling. They sold, <clears throat> excuse me, they sold ads in the Phoenix and um, never enough to really pay for anything substantial, but it was uh, a way um, to indicate support for the community and, and uh, to generate a little bit of income for the society. The Phoenix also produced a number of other um, 
worked with a number of other groups, uh, civic groups. This, this venereal disease brochure was produced in conjunction with the Kansas City uh, Public Health Department very early on um, in 1967 and a uh, report from an issue of the Phoenix about the um, uh, Bergstein relationship with the society and the police department and trying to address some of the issues that were going on um, with law enforcement. Members of the Phoenix also uh, were active in, in regional organizations as they get, as they, um, get formed and there is a national organization that does eventually emerge from that 1966 meeting and it's called the North American Conference of Homophile Organizations. It officially forms after the uh, 1966 meeting in San Francisco and uh, the North American Conference of Homophile Organizations uh, becomes known as NACO and NACO uh, relies uh, on members of the Phoenix um, uh, and takes advantage of their access to the printing press and the Phoenix, members of the Phoenix Society become um, the clearinghouse, the national clearinghouse for NACO. And again, because of that access to the printing press, which is invaluable, that's like having, that's like being the sole access to the internet at this point. So, um, so members of the Phoenix are not only doing all the stuff that we just saw, but they're also highly active in this clearinghouse, which is a means of um, uh, sort of uh, centralizing the distribution of information because all the members of NACO, and NACO was an umbrella organization for all these different homophile groups across the country, like Mattachine chapters and um, the Phoenix and chapters of the Daughters of Belitis. And what was supposed to happen is each, each member of NACO was supposed to get the publications of all the other members, which is a logistical nightmare. Again, this is all before computers and they're all having to, they're having to do all of this on paper and keep this organized. So they're trying to do that. They're trying, and they publish their own newsletter about the activities of the Clearinghouse Committee. And they offer their services to other homophile groups uh, in the United States to print the newsletters of those groups. And so they see a lot of traffic in that respect. Vector was out of uh, Los Angeles, Tangents was out of San Francisco, and the Blue and the Homophile Action League was in Philadelphia. So by 68, the Phoenix opens up Phoenix House, which is Kansas City's first gay and lesbian uh, community center. And um, it houses a printing press, it houses meeting rooms, uh, Drew lived on the third floor and they provided apartment living for folks in crisis on the second floor of the house. So by 68, the Phoenix guys, and it was mostly men, there were a, a, a small handful of women sporadically involved, but it was mostly men. Phoenix is really, really busy. They're doing all this clearinghouse work. They're doing their own work. They're involved in NACO and 68, a local man in Kansas City is, is elected president of NACO. And so there's just all this activity going on and they really overstretched themselves uh, so that by the conference in 1968, where the um, Kansas City is elected president, they also, as a group, um, vote on this motto that gay is good, which was fashioned after the Black is Beautiful model that um, sort of emerges as part of the Black civil rights movement. But what's going on also by 68 um, is um, a maturation of the homophile movement. Um, you've got people who have been involved for a very long time and are getting older. And then you've got a new generation of activists who want to be far more militant and far more, and far more confrontational about securing these rights. And so you, you, by this point, you see a lot of tension between those two factions. Um, the young people, the young generation who want to do things really, really differently than the more traditional um, uh, uh, assimilationist kind of approach of the homophiles. And so when the uh, uprisings happen at the Stonewall Inn and are successful, they successfully, um, the folks at the Stonewall successfully 
um, protest, counter protest, the police, um, it, it's very clear that uh, this is a shift in approach to securing civil rights um, because the for the first time, um, these activists are successful in their efforts to um, to win over the police, and it, it really does trigger a change. It's it's a flashpoint, and it points to the fact that this militant approach, and you can't get much more militant than throwing bottles at police. Uh, this militant approach is going is going to succeed and going to take over and dominate over the homophile approach. So NACO meets in Kansas City again in 69, just a few weeks after the Stonewall riots. And they meet at this hotel, um, the Bell Reeve, which is in Midtown, Kansas City. And they had a, they had a full slate, they had a week long uh, uh, conference planned. And it was a full slate of, of uh, programs and, and the typical kinds of things that, pe that uh, these activists came to expect from a NACO meeting. But what happens is the, um, the young people uh, sort of steal the thunder of the homophiles and they make all these demands and they interrupt uh, business meetings and they just become um, confrontational at the conference. And so um, some newspaper coverage of, of uh, some of the discussions that did, did happen and so it's very clear to the older leaders in NACO that this is the wave of the future. And so that by 70, 1970, um, NACO meets one more time and they decide to, to uh, dissolve because they recognize that these militants who are exemplified by this poster um, are, are, are gonna supersede them. Because what happens after Stonewall is this explosion of all these um, these youth oriented organizations that spring up um, in, in, in light of the success of the riots uh, in Greenwich Village. And you see groups like the Gay Liberation Front and um, uh, the Gay Activist Alliance um, start to form and see, uh, you see really uh, meaningful change happen very, very quickly. It, and it's, it's very obvious even in the names. Um, Gay Liberation Front is very, very different than Mattachine Society, right? And so it's just, that's just indicative of, of the difference in approach. And so um, the, difference, uh, differences, the difference between these two pictures is just five years. Uh, the one on the left is 65 and actually 64, and the one on the right is 69. And so uh, it just points to the, the condensed nature of all the changes that were happening within the struggle for gay and lesbian civil rights during the 1960s, on top of all the other changes that were going on in the United States. But um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's exciting to think about the fact that people here in Kansas City had pivotal roles in bringing about um, some of the changes that did occur during this very important and pivotal uh, decade of the country's history. And so with that, I thank you all very much. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Stuart. Um, like always, you give a wonderful talk. Um, there are a few questions. Uh, the first one is, um, is there any like LGBTQ walking tour or driving tour in Kansas City that if someone wanted to come up and see these places, would they be able to identify them or? At this point, there is not. I am in conversations with folks at the city to do a heritage trail, an LGBT heritage trail, um, but we're just in the discussion stages at this point. So unfortunately, um, there is no, there is a marker down at 12th and at Twelfth and Wyandotte, we install a historic marker across the street from where that hotel was, where that meeting was held. Um, but other than that, uh, there really is no um, sort of coordinated um, uh, tour kind of experience at this point. But Knockwood, we'll get something going. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, is the Phoenix Society still standing? The house that? No, um, the Phoenix uh, about the Phoenix folds about the same time as Nake. Actually, they they fold in seventy one. 
uh, for, for many of the same reasons, um, a different kind of membership uh, and uh, they really, they just overextended themselves into, um, into, into dissolving. They just, they just had just taken on too much. And then the last question is, is how could someone come up to visit the archives? We are located at UMKC. We're located in the Miller Nichols Library uh, um, on the third floor in a department called Labuddy Special Collections. We are part of the Special Collections Department. Um, and if you're coming, we're open Monday through Friday, 9 to 4.30. If you're coming, uh, give me a heads up. Um, because everything is in storage and I'm happy to pull stuff out and show folks, but I just have to know ahead of time. If you don't want to make the trip, there's a lot on the Glamour website. Um, like all those party pics are available online. Um, we have some really interesting videos from the AIDS uh, period, the late 1980s, early 1990s. There's a full length documentary on the website about um, the uh, the AIDS crisis and how it morphed into um, the struggle to get a non-discrimination ordinance passed in Kansas City. Uh, I was thinking we might show that next year. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, there's, a, there's a lot of content online. Um, uh, so e either way, but yeah, um, just you could just reach out to me. My, my contact info is all over the Glamour website. And uh, I, I, I love sharing this stuff with folks. So if, if you wanna, if you wanna, if you wanna come up, um, be happy to be happy to share it with you. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions we had in the chat. We did have um, a message from one of our panelists on Monday or Tuesday night um, that said, "Thank you for sharing this and archiving the history." So um, it's my for, oh, sorry. It's a pleasure and an honor, actually. Yeah. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us and your knowledge. It's always a pleasure to listen to you speak. And I've got a long list of people to look up now and find out more information because it's good. always good information. So thank you, Stuart, for taking the time and, and speaking with us today. And thanks to all the audience members who turned in today. Um, and we will see you tomorrow for our last Lunch and Learn workshop with Luz Cruz from the Queer, Queer Kitchen Brigade. Um, and they will be talking about LGBTQ and, the, and climate change. So thank you, Stuart. Thank you to everyone that tuned in and have a great rest of your afternoon.